Clubbers, dancers, morning vibin'. What is up? How are you? I'm Jeff Kanata. I'm with Lana Bashinsky. How are you, Lana? I am doing well. Thank you. You would think after podcasting yesterday morning, I would have been like, you know, I should really deal with the big, ugly cardboard box right behind me. But I chose not to. It's an aesthetic choice now. Yes. it's. Yeah. Uh, this is my new style. Yeah. That's your new style. Office glass. That's what we're talking about. Um <laughs> Well, welcome, folks. Very excited to talk to you this morning because we are working through Memories of Ice, the third novel in the Malazan Books of the Fallen by Stephen Erickson. We are on chapters five and six this week. Lots to dig into. Chapter five is meaty. Lots of really cool stuff. Ends on a cliffhanger after chapter six. Very excited to dig into all of it. But the first thing I want to do ladies and gentlemen, is give you a public service announcement. Because if you happen to be one of those folks that just hangs out with us to talk about the non-spoiler topic at the beginning of the show, or if you've only bought up to book three so far and you plan to continue with us through the rest of the series, have I got a deal for you. Right now, the Humble Bundle is featuring all of the Malazan Books of the Fallen written by Steven Erickson. This is beyond just the 10 main books of the series. That's his, I think it's a prequel trilogy and novellas. Everything that Steven Erickson has written that involves the Malazan Books of the Fallen Tor, the publisher, has put onto the Humble Bundle. So portions of the proceeds go to charity. You can actually select how much. Uh, and uh, you, can, you can pay a very, very small amount, huge savings. It is pay what you can. It is uh, there intended to uh, benefit a charity. So head over to humblebundle.com slash books and check it out because you can get the entire series for a very low price right now. So, you know, no excuses. No excuses anymore, everybody. <laughs> you can hang out with us and talk about these novels. All right, Lana. Yes. We always start the show with our non-spoiler section. And last week we talked about audiobooks and we left off that conversation saying, hey, you know what? I think there might need to be a part two about this conversation <laughs> because um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty, uh, you know, a, a pretty big topic. The idea of when you choose to read a novel, when you choose to listen to it, an audiobook, and really what makes a great audiobook. And you gave a lot of your thoughts about what you prefer uh, as far as, uh, as far as clarity over speed and all that stuff. One of the mm -hmm. things we didn't talk about was character voices. And you had mentioned listening to Tim Curry uh, read uh, as an audio narrator and how he had these very subtle distinctions uh, between characters with voices. I'm curious what your feeling is about that because I've been an audio narrator. I have a, a one audiobook you can get on Audible right now called Traveling in Space. I'm working on another one as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and my tendency, you may be shocked to learn, <laughs> <laughs> is to use uh, big, wacky, weird voices. That's not really true. Not back wacky and weird, but very distinctive voices. Use, uh, you know, very, um, very, very distinct, you know, pick a, a voice for a character and really commit to it. Uh, mm -hmm. is, is, uh, you don't need to worry about my feelings. Uh, if you, <laughs> is that something that you appreciate or do you prefer the sort of just slight tonal shift in a voice with an audio narrator? Uh. I think that in the way that I mentioned Tim Curry's like subtlety between some of his voices, I wasn't doing him the justice that he deserves. Mm. Between characters that are like human normal characters, they he has human normal voices, but they are definitely larger than life kind of spectacular characters. Um, I don't want to spoil the book, so I won't. But like characters that, uh require something like if you were like what's the voice of this character and you're like i'm a demon 
and you're like a normal demon voice, he goes all in for those things. Yeah, There's also cool. a, a very sassy feline, and I love it. <laughs> what I love about Tim Curry is that he's doing the voice that feels right for the character. Um, I've talked before, I think, in the episode where we're interviewing Steven about like uh, the sense of like appeal as an animator is like a uh, one of the 12 principles of animation and appeal doesn't mean like, Oh, that appeals to me. It right. means that the thing feels right for the thing it's intended to be. So villains should feel villainous, you know, cute things should feel cute, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that is what I'm looking for, or the things I enjoy most in audiobook narrators is when the thing feels like it should. And sometimes that calls for a voice that is larger than life. But if everybody is is reading the book, or like every single line, every single sentence is delivered with the same level of exuberance and over the top, everybody's got a wacky voice. I find that to be as exhausting as if everything was completely monotonous. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause one of the things we talked about and, you know, I'd heard Mr. Erickson talk about, um, on a critical dragon, um, YouTube channel is th this layer of, of performance that the narrator brings to the experience that you are getting a secondhand interpretation of the text, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're a reader, you're getting that one-to-one -one relationship with the, uh, author. If you're listening to the audiobook, you're hearing somebody else's cadence. And one of the things that I do as an audiobook narrator that I really pride myself in is performing, right? I, mm -hmm. I do a performance, but I'm wondering if the preference for others is to just the facts, ma'am, you know, just give me, just read it as, as not blandly, but as, um, as dispassionately perhaps as possible so that I can infer all those things. Cause when I'm doing an audiobook, if I'm, if there's an action sequence, if there's something dramatic happening, I will change, I will perform it as if I'm telling that story to someone and now, oh my gosh, this is happening. And, and then my speed and my pace or my, you know, inflections change to kind of infer that dramatic tension uh, rather than letting the words do the work. But I wonder I... if that's maybe not what f some folks prefer. Well, I can't speak to some folks, but for me, going to an audiobook, I, I do feel like I am opting into a type of theater. I yeah. do feel like that is something that I'm seeking from that experience, and that's what makes it something different and deliberate and special as opposed to just reading the normal book. There's yeah. a, an element of convenience, obviously, like listening to an audiobook allows me to multitask versus right. like it's like sitting and reading and like sort of that deliberate action. But I do think that's what I'm seeking. Like when I think back to like some of my favorite moments in an audiobook, in the same way that I sort of pick out like a favorite sentence from the way that we're reading week over week, it's the moments when the writing does infiltrate the this the speech. Mm. Like uh, a lot of the authors that I've, or a lot of the authors, a lot of them, the vocalists, the voice actors that I've listened to with audiobooks, they'll have those moments where they're like, <laughs> uh, maybe they they laughed nervously right, and that right. nervous laugh is pulled into right. that line. line reading. Yeah. And, but it's not like they, they skip then the part where they laughed nervously. They're still reading the book. The performance is in there. It's not overacted, right. but it's, it's woven together. And I, it feels like theater in a way that I really enjoy. Yeah, I do too. I do too. And the best, uh, the best audiobook narrators that I've encountered are a mix of both of those that they're not like they're not imposing too much onto it mm -hmm. in order to to change it into something else, but they are letting the words inform the delivery, and that's yeah. what I strive for as well. Uh, we got some feedback, uh, folks in the Discord talking about this audiobook um, topic. One of our listeners, this is one of the listeners that is not doing the read along with us, but still tunes in for these non-spoiler sections. S Dub eighty six, hi S Dub, uh, says uh, has some audiobook recommendations for us. Uh, S Dub says, I highly recommend listening to an audiobook read by famous sci fi author Harlan Ellison. I've listened to two so far: Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne and uh, The Wizard of Earth Sea by Ursula Le Guin. Um, I've listened to a lot of audiobooks and I've never heard, heard any read, excuse me, any read with the energy he reads them with. 
I swear I could hear him standing up in a recording booth and putting his whole body into the performance, sweating and panting with the effort. Uh, he doesn't quite do the character voices as well as some readers, but the experience is joyous and electric, which I think is interesting. He's saying he's not really doing character voices, but he's adding that layer of interpretation that we're kind of talking about that, that dramatic performance. Mm -hmm. uh, SW also wrote, uh, I absolutely love the audiobook for Gone Girl, um, which has a narration split between um, a male reader for the male parts and a woman reader for the woman parts because it has, that book has two points of view. Actually, I read that book. I enjoyed that book. Um, and uh, he said that the best, uh, best audiobook narration performance that SW86 has ever uh, experienced was The Martian by Andy Weir. Oh. The character voices were amazing. Did Andy Weir, sorry, read it? Or I suspect it not. No, I, yeah. he, uh, <laughs> there's no mention of who the actual narrator is. Perhaps I can look it up. Did, um, I, ever, did I ever tell you my favorite Andy Weir story? No, I think you you referenced having an Andy Weir story. Yeah. But uh, go ahead. And, can you tell it? Is it? I I can. Talking outside of school. Kind of, but <laughs> <laughs> I you know I want to be like Andy's never going to find this, but I would have said the same thing about Stephen, and yet here we are. Um, <laughs> sorry, every time Andy Weir's name comes up, this pops into my head. It is one of my favorite silliest things to ever have been told to me. Um. Uh. Uh, my former boss, when I was working at a, a company called Blizzard Entertainment, uh, loved doing small, harmless pranks. And I, the word pranks, I'm not down with pranks. I don't like it. But when I say small, harmless pranks, I mean like taping a sticky under your mouse so that you have to pick it up and look that he did like a cute drawing for you. Like harmless right. pranks. But one day he's like, I'm going big. There's a guy at the office and he has filled his room uh, with Coca-Cola cans. He's lined the walls with Coca-Cola cans. He did the math. This isn't he the prank. This is just the, this is this the is person's the way choice. The person's eye. <laughs> yeah. Office looks. Yes. Okay. Uh, he we did the math. He went in and counted like the rows and the columns. And he, for, I don't know, I think he said he drank it for a year, drank Pepsi and collected every single can and as soon as he had enough, he's like, I'm getting in there and I'm going to swap out every single Coca-Cola can with a Pepsi can. Hilarious. Hilarious. Harmless prank. So right. silly. Yeah. Okay. The weekend it goes in, they go in on a Saturday, they swap everything out. They're like, this is going to be amazing. And come Monday morning, that person left the company. <laughs> they never saw it? They never saw it. <laughs> And that person was Andy Weir. Oh, no way. Author of The Martian. <laughs> he went off to make a, uh, make a, write a novel, turn it into a film. Never saw the prank. Never he got saw. committed a year of drinking Pepsi. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, it's uh. my favorite. Very tangential Andy Weir story. <laughs> but just thinking about my boss being like, I'm going to prank now famous Andy now Weir. <laughs> I want. I hope Andy Weir does see this because I feel like that might be the only way he'll ever know this even happened. I know. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, hilarious that SW86 couldn't recall the name of the narrator of the Martian audiobook because it's Will Wheaton. <laughs> yes, evidently. That's what it says on Audible. Uh, oh, Will Wheaton, so very famous human. Uh, and uh, I can understand. He's, Will Wheaton has done a number of audiobooks. So mm -hmm. I think he's done a whole bunch for a lot of different people. So it's very funny that uh, he did, you know, famously, <laughs> Will Wheaton did uh, um, Ready Player One, and he's, uh, he's done all kinds of stuff. He did a Wesley Crusher, I think, famously. <laughs> yeah, a little more famous, I guess. Uh, I, <laughs> I have that. a Will Wheaton story, too, but we can save that for later. <laughs> oh, now we got a tease for next week. Tune in next week for the Will Wheaton story. Uh, I've met Will a couple times. He's very nice. Yeah. Nice person. Um all right. Well, that was delightful. Let's move on and talk about chapters five and six of Memories of Ice. So spoilers <sighs> starting now. Chapter five, Lana, is a doozy. Big, meaty, tons of information. We start on the plains with Talk and Lady Envy and Tool and the Segale. Segula? Segula? Se segu segula. 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 I have that liquid you. My acting teacher would be <laughs> mad at me. Um, and uh, uh, we start with tool making tools. I love this. I love the tool making tools scene where he's just like, uh, you want to learn how to make some arrows and 
knives and stuff. Uh, I <laughs> love the. Like, I would, but we don't have anything. He's like, sorry, let me step back. You want to learn how to make some tools to make <laughs> some arrows to make. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. We we will make the tools to make the thing. Yeah, yeah. We, we have four step process. I mm -hmm. think I love I love this just because of the level of detail and uh, verisimilitude, right? The the level of authenticity here that you know uh, how you would actually make these things without without fletcher's tools you know you don't yeah. have twine so he's like we're gonna use in gut because i killed an antelope and uh no problem woo you know uh, what about uh do we need anything yeah i killed a bunch of seagulls here sack <laughs> of seagulls no problem i mm -hmm. love it um that uh that scene is a lot of interesting as tool is working He's also just spilling the beans about Lady Envy <laughs> and her history with Anamanda Rake and Caladan Brood and this other fella, Osric. Everybody's going to correct me, but I feel like it's the first time we've heard about Osric. I feel like it's the first time we've heard about Osric in a way that's not just like a name on a page. Does that right. make sense? Yeah, like, so th this is clearly I feel a very like important character. There's a couple character. times a brain like or a, a name like tickles my brain, and it's mm. either because it was like one of those sub names at the beginning of like the poetry section or like the historical piece yeah. at the beginning of a chapter, or somebody's been like, ah, oh, blah blah, blah. yeah, Osric once maybe, and that's like the only time we've heard about it. Um, right. But, uh, but I agree with you. That this is the first time that, in my recollection, that we've heard anything more than that. We we have tiers of characters in, as far as power levels and historical importance, and it does feel like Anamanda Rake, Caladan Brood, Lady Envy are in that top echelon tier, S -tier and evidently Osric yeah. is there too. Yeah, S tier characters, uh, <laughs> but Osric, you know, had a falling out. There's a lot of a lot of petty uh, uh, disagreements, it seems, between all these folks. Osric had a falling out, so I I suspect we'll hear more about this character later. Um, mm. One of the most interesting things that we learn here is that the Segula uh, have had their own problems with the Penny and Domen. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Tool asks the, the Segula uh, Senu, like, hey, why, what are you doing out here? What are you even wandering around? Why are you? And he's like, well, hey, um, the Penny and Domen priests keep coming to our island and we have to murder them, but that hasn't stopped them. So we decided we'll leave and murder away from home as well <laughs> to maybe I, dis, you know, maybe uh, disincentivize them from doing that anymore. Yeah, I love their the matter of factness, this like the social structure of being like, I'm not talking to you if you're. Wait, do they talk? They talk to you if you're not worth their time. They're like, you're not a threat if you're, to me. If you're, yeah, if you're beneath them, uh they will not talk to you that's why tool is the only one that can talk to them yes because they respect tool they have no respect for talk <laughs> the younger which he's like like he, they're like they don't consider you a threat but they also won't pay attention to anything you do <laughs> yeah you're like uh somebody's pet mouse in the corner like yeah. it's just a way you're an um, adorable toddler is what yeah. you are to them <laughs> so talk like or not talk tool like talking to them and they're just like the way that they speak, it's like they're not speaking or they're just being so straightforward. Yeah. I love the whole structure of the, the Segula it's so, so far. Rad. It's and great. This story about Anamanda Rake, like just for just for kicks, decides he's going to visit the island. He's like, let's see what these people are all about. And they're <laughs> yeah. like, well, let's fight. And then they, for, two, for two hours, he has to fight them. And he's like, fine, I will leave. This is exhausting. <laughs> and they're like, why doesn't that guy come back? He's the seventh among us now. He's <laughs> earned the rank of seventh among us. Yeah, he, they're like, well, we you, you know him? Back. We have his stuff. We <laughs> got the, his mask. The mask. We, we yeah. painted it. It's the seventh <laughs> mask for him. Come back, dude. It was so fun oh, fighting you. And he's like, this is exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I love it. It's so rad. Uh, I know. I The, the Segula are, I mean, this book is amazing because there's like 14 different races or species or cultures that would could support their own novel. You know, like yeah. I would be fascinated just to have a novel about the Segula or or the Bargast. You know, we find mm -hmm. out all these cool stuff about all these different cultures, and each of them is fascinating and has is full of so much detail and interesting idiosyncrasies that 
I, you know, like you could support their own novel and then you just one passing thing in a side story and this you know the third novel of this series it's crazy <laughs> yeah um and then of course we get uh, another attack on tool where <laughs> through rule is like oh, oh, i can beat him i can beat him and they, they go <laughs> off and fight and lady envy's like oh please seriously stop i with the fight. said knock it off children um my favorite part is he comes back from that fight and they're like oh my god you're all torn up and he's like yeah the fight was really difficult and we, again you're gonna have to be the name guy here mott muck uh mock m-o-k mock. yeah mock uh is like listening in like yeah he fought you good and tool's like all the more difficult that i use the flat of my blade and you could see him like say what <laughs> he's like oh snap! <laughs> he's like i'm gonna have to fight this guy we all know i'm gonna have to fight this guy <laughs> the craziest part for me was sen is yeah, everybody's talking about how senu is the lowest among them but still um, incredibly badass and and sen he's like so like how old are you? And he's like 14. Is that uh, yeah. what? <laughs> yeah, but I've been fighting for 12 years or something like that. He's like, what? So since yeah. you were two. I could uh, lift my amazing. arm with a sword in it faster than I could lift my own neck. Yeah. Incredibly cool. But I feel like this, a lot of this was just sort of hanging out, goofy stuff, Lady Envy trying to take a bath, <laughs> just like hitting on talk still. Very but, fun yeah. stuff. But we also got, um, the tool revealed uh, through through talks, sort of realizations of what's happening that Lady Envy has, like these Segula are likely not here as her like servant guard uh, by their own will. Right? Did I she's interpret that correctly? She's, them. she's ensorcelled them. Yeah. And so they're like, why why are they here helping her? It's like, well, they're here for the same reason that there's suddenly hot bath water. Because right. she is doing magic on them. Yeah. And so there's an interesting relationship at play there that seems like could be something tenuous Agreed. Yes. later. Interesting. Yes. Um, we, then we head over and check back in with uh, Whiskey Jack, Quick Ben, Mallet. They have returned to that same place where Tattersail and Hairlock were betrayed by uh, Tayshren in Gardens of the Moon. And they start talking about Paran uh, and uh, or Perrin and um, and all of the stuff that's going on with him. Talking about him being a near ascendant, and he's kind of the touching the blood, the freeing the hounds. That's like pushing him down this corridor, mm -hmm. and they don't know what will happen when he gets to the end of the corridor. But they decide let's keep pushing him, but, you know, but tastefully so. <laughs> when it seems like it's a good time to like give him a boot. Yeah. Just really shove them. Just <laughs> throw them down the corridor. What's going to happen at the end? Who can say? Bad things, possibly. <laughs> but let's just find out. Let's but find maybe out. a super powerful ally. Uh. Yeah, could be something good. Could be something <laughs> bad. Um, so uh, we also find out that there's been multiple night chills, uh, which is what my but, wife would tell me did, when I leave but, the air conditioning on. <laughs> There's been multiple <laughs> night chills. But, um, ha but have we found out there's multiple night chills? I interpreted that as somebody being like, there's definitely been people named night chill through time that were mm. definitely all different people, right? Couldn't possibly have been the same person. Oh, interesting. I, I got the sense that she's been reincarnated, uh, but maybe uh -huh. you're right. It's just like she keeps being mentioned and it's the same person throughout history because it was uh, mm -hmm. the sister of cold nights. Yeah, uh, elder I mean, god. Either way, like w whether or not she's, it's like a uh, you know Coltane butterfly soul embedding situation, mm -hmm. or it's literally the same night chill. It implies like such an extreme power to have had yes. the that kind of longevity yes. um, over time. And we know, we found out that her Warren is the Warren of Darkness, mm -hmm. which is interesting as well. Uh, and then there's a lot of there's a lot there's whiskey jack and do jack have a a scene where they're talking about what they should do uh how you know the gathering of the talana moss is going to be uh scary and bad most probably that mm -hmm. calor wants to kill silver fox and what they should do whiskey jack is standing fast and saying i'm not going to let the dude kill a child even if it's a super fast growing mostly not a child child mm -hmm. um and they talk about how uh, Kelenved had restraint in using the Talana Moss when he was building the empire originally. 
interesting stuff there. And then we have uh, Caladan Brood talking to Maybe and saying that uh, I, there's lots of, I love all of these little discussion groups where we're getting yeah. a lot of filling out of lore. We're getting a lot of, uh, you know, trying to discern what we should do moving forward. What's the plan going to be? All that stuff is very juicy to me. Yeah. Um, and especially because there are like so many, I like it because like all the pieces are, are separate, but it does feel like, I feel much like I did at the beginning of, of, or through Gardens of the Moon, where I'm like, there's so many pieces. Yes. It's like been hard to sort of keep it more challenging, certainly than the second book to keep it all in my brain of like what all of the, the playing cards are that are sort of out and sort of, tr so I like trying to do that thing where I'm like, do these two connect? Is this going right. to be the part that weaves together? But there's so many small pieces that I feel like I haven't really been able to to do that yet. I'm still just trying to like, you know, flip over all the the pieces of the puzzle before I can even start finding the edges, you know? I'm finding it to be more clear because I feel like all of these connections are really being laid out now. And I feel like I understand how these big forces relate to each other. One of the interesting things that Erickson is doing in these books is there's not just one big threat, right? It's mm -hmm. not just Sauron, you know, trying to take over the world. It, th there's, there's the Panion Domain. That's a, that's a threat. There's burn, maybe sickness. Dying, sickness. There's yeah. The, the fallen God is a problem. There's, there's uh, all the, you know, there's, all the stuff happening over in seven cities. That's a, that's an issue. And the uh, whirlwind, mm -hmm. like there's all of these things. And I think one of the things that we learn in these chapters, or at least that is, uh, that is uh, suggested in these chapters is that all of this stuff is connected in on some level. Yes. And, you know, somebody's I can't remember who it was. Somebody points out that the Panion Domen use chaos and the fallen God's power is chaos. And so there's yeah. got to be a connection between all this happening at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. And I think somebody even says, who is it that's uh, it's later. Somebody says. Um, Br Brood and uh, Rake talking together. No, I think it's, um, I think it's when uh, Perrin goes back to, we'll get to that in a second. When Perrin yeah. goes back into the, the thinnest and Raced is there and he's like, you know, you got chosen to be this master of decks. Why, why, why? Well, because there's a war coming. I know there's already a lot of wars. He's like, no, 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 no. This is it's the all... big one where everything is affected. Gods, mortals, yeah. everything in between. It's all happening. And so mm -hmm. I feel like that's the idea is that there's all these, Erickson has laid out all of these disparate crises, but mm -hmm. we're going to learn that it's just one big crisis that is... Interconnected. Yeah, I, I guess the, the piece that I'm sort of talking to when I'm talking about like, you know, the, these puzzle pieces is like the order of operations. And then maybe that's the point is that there's not going to be like, first we, we stop the Panion Dome and then we fix the, the world. Like, right. it's all going to be like, everything's messed up at the same time. Yeah. Scatter. <laughs> but that's what's so fun is all the spinning plates, right? Is that everything... I've never really read a, a series like this where there's a thousand things. And one of the fun characters that illustrates this is Quick Ben, who's like, okay, I got to deal with the, literally the entire planet might lose all life on it. Okay, but I can't even bother Whiskey Jack with that because like that's so, he's got enough to deal with. You know, it's, it's amazing. It seems, it seems bigger than everything, but it's not. It, and it's, it is, but it's definitely not yeah, yeah. right now. We're going to yeah. worry in order. Okay. I, it's, <laughs> it's so great. It's it's so thrilling because it just feels like there's thing upon thing upon thing going on. And it's all, it's all important. It's all interesting. It's all it, it, the fact that Erickson can like keep spinning those plates, can keep, you know, injecting more and more and more urgency on every level is pretty neat. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, then we get a fun moment where uh, the Darugistan folks show up and Krupp comes flying out of a, uh, flying out of a carriage. My oh. angel. Krupp, I was so, baby, I was we so happy. Woo! We missed you. 
Yeah. Uh, eating some sweet cakes, having a good old time. <laughs> And uh, and uh, Marilio is back. It was cool to see Marilio. Mm-hmm. Um, Krupp is is a delight. Uh, everybody immediately hates him. <laughs> well, it, like he shows up and he's like, "I am here. I am part of the contingent. Like I am a humble servant of Baruch, who definitely sent me." And Marilio shows up. And he's like, "You stole all of our horses." <laughs> That's what Those Baruch would have be wanted me us. to do. He's like, how, did you speak to Baruch? No, our relationship is beyond like just talking. We <laughs> sense each other's intentions. It's so yeah. great. He is so awesome. And just he's like so despicable. Like reading about him, like Ugh. like he's like, oh, I love talking, him. and he's like coughing and spitting like food <laughs> constantly. But he's also like. Uh, like saying something so humbling, me just so <laughs> humble. I'm definitely right, and you will all realize that I'm right. But it's just, it's just uh, yeah. that's how it. As this time, maybe you'll be right next time. <laughs> it's like this. <laughs> My favorite is is when he he suggests that the Trigal Trade Guild should should be the ones that handle all the uh, all the you know reinforcement logistics. All, yeah, yeah, and, and, and they're and they're like, oh, that sounds like a really good idea. Wait, have you invested in them? He's like. Yes, but that's not why I'm <laughs> suggesting it. It just happens to be a weird coincidence that I will be financially enriched. And also they happen to be the the, the perfect. The most expensive <laughs> possible, perfect solution to this problem. Don't, okay. Don't get distracted by how much it benefits me that my suggestion <laughs> should be accepted by all of you. Think more about how it's a great suggestion. <laughs> He's awesome. He's uh, so awesome. So great. I love him. Yeah. And he shows up and he, you know, he's he's it's all an act, right? He's he really is this mastermind that's doing stuff, but it's and he shows what? up and the maybe's like, "Hey, I met you before. Remember that dream?" And he's like, "Oh yeah. Oh yeah, girl. I remember." Um, but then he but like, also don't don't talk don't talk to me about that right here. Yeah, well, Caledon Bruce is like, "What elder god was there?" And he's like, "Hey, delicious food let's what, what yeah. are you talking about <laughs> it's so what good. was his name I, I kept trying to recall i probably should have looked it up the n- name that he had there was like in the gardens of the moon there was that one guy oh, who's like the, sort of the circle yeah it's an animal circle. it's an the animal snake no it's some it's something more it's like the uh the, the it's like a, i want to say it's an a water the otter. i know yeah. Anyway, I'll put it up anyway, on the screen. It'll yeah. already have shown. We'll, I was trying to remember like his like code name. Yeah. Like, the whole time I was reading, I couldn't. I know, it, me but. too. I can't recall it. But anyway. Let us know in the comments. <laughs> I'll put it up on the screen. We'll Fine. Already, yeah. I'll well, do the legwork, Lana, it. You later. Think, well, you think I'm going to scrub through this video later? No, I need to know <laughs> in the comments. <laughs> um. All right, so uh, and then Crone is there, and she has some fun, uh, fun back and forth with uh, Krupp and everybody. Um, I love how she and Krupp are like, kind of like, "Oh, you're ridiculous. Hey. I'm ridiculous too." <laughs> annoying, annoying, <laughs> huh? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and but then we get some really interesting stuff because we find out that I mean, she goes under the table uh, and see, has seen that the the deck of dragons has a new card which is Perrin she freaks out when she sees Perrin um because Perrin is the new card a giant a giant deck of dragons card underneath this table mm-hmm. but also we see that um that there's a new uh a, a new card that is the assassin of high house shadow which is Kalam or Kalam. Yeah. Kalam. So Kalam is a member of the deck of drag, which feels like pretty awesome. Feels awesome. Interesting. I am like every time I read the words shadow or the words darkness, those are two different houses. Is correct. that correct? Yes. Yeah. So he's uh shadow assassin of is, shadow, which is shadow, shadow is throne. Cotillion and and um Callum oh, new yeah. name is what? Is oh Shadow Throne. Yeah. So Shadow, Shadow Throne. Throne is high, high House Shadow. Mm-hmm. But in, but I what I find is so interesting is that these events are happening in parallel with the events of novel two of Dead yes. House Gates. So Kalam ha- is starting the whirlwind, and that's why he's right. It's he hasn't well, done is, the yeah, thing is that, that he like does. When at the he end. took the book. 
is that when he like went off on his own? I'm like trying to match. Right. That's what the, I don't know. Because event. he hasn't, he literally meets up with the, the empress at the end. And I feel like that's when he would ascend to, but that hasn't happened yet. I think in the timeline. Uh, yeah. I think we have to see quick Ben bleeding out before then. Correct. Yes. Yes. Uh, anyway, uh, I think all of this is is really cool stuff. Um, and, oh boy, we get, um, we get Perrin, uh, Perrin disappears at one point, but I don't know if we've done, we've gotten to that no. point yet. So, no, not yet. Uh, they, oh, <laughs> Anamanda Rake shows up first. Yeah, you know, yeah, Rake shows up and, uh, Perrin's the only one who can, who as he flies by can actually see him because of yeah. his like ascendant sight. I didn't realize that when he was like in dragon form, he was also possibly invisible. Yeah. Uh, which was fascinating. So Rake shows up and there's kind of like, you have all these factions coming together being like, we're going to be allies. We're allies. No killing each other. We're allies. Yeah. And then Rake shows up and he's like. I don't know. I'm kind of ready to kill the child. <laughs> and then immediately all the divisions are like, take your side. <laughs> like yeah. instantaneously. Oh, that, that whole sequence was so rad. The arrival of Rake where all the Tisti and D like form a circle and they're like, our Lord is coming. Yeah. The son of darkness. And then this amazing looking black silver mane dragon flies over and he lands in the center of the circle. He's like, what's up? Yeah. <laughs> I'm awesome. <laughs> And they're like, sweet, so glad you're here. This girl, this little 10 year old uh, is, a, is a thing we've never experienced in the world. And he's like, oh, you wanted me to come here and tell you what to do about it. I get mm -hmm. it. And Keller's like, we want to kill her. And everybody's like, we don't want to kill her. And he's like, yeah, I get it. I stand <laughs> I, alone. And then Amanda's like, well, I, yeah, I, I get you, bro. You stand alone. I, I feel like it was, uh, in my recollection, he like shows up. He's like, what's up, everybody? And before anybody said anything, says anything, Keller's like, listen, before any of the other fools start talking, we're killing her. We're going to kill her. You're going <laughs> to yeah. kill her. And everybody's and like, like none, none of us agree with that. <laughs> and uh, he, he goes, Keller, it sounds like you're alone. He's like, it was ever thus. And Adam yeah. and Rake's like, I get you, bro. I've been the lone <laughs> person before, too. All right. I'm on Keller's side. We're killing this girl. And everybody's well, like, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't pull out Dragnapur up in but, here. Yeah. Uh, and he's like, we have no idea what will happen. There's like a lot of magic that none of us really understand. Um, but what I thought was interesting is that he's like, okay, wait, this kid? And then he like sends out like smoke energy magic. Yeah, just to, to check like, her out. Just to suss her out. Yeah. And she immediately releases like releases some amount of power, and yeah. she's like, "I just just having a little defensive thing." Yeah, he says he literally says, uh, "I've never had my hands slapped in like that in before." The, yeah. yeah, so she smacks him away, and then uh, everybody starts doing the like standing in front of her. Whiskey Jack literally goes, and I just picture him looking like a stone sentinel sitting yeah. there, like sword in the ground in front of himself, like very intense moment. Um, and then that's where Peron, I think is like literally out in somewhere else. Yeah. And then gets kind of. Yeah. We go to Picker's, there. we get to go, go to Picker's point of view and she's like, hey, look, there's Perrin. What's, what's he up to? Boop! And he blinks out of existence. Mm -hmm. And he shows up there. And he's like, hey, everybody. And then there's like, oh, there's a giant table with my face on it. And everybody's like, <laughs> well, that's oh. something. <laughs> uh, and But the thing I couldn't tell is that, is that something that he uncontrollably controlled? I think it is, right? Because he now has the power to sort of be anywhere. Or was that um, Silver Fox being like, to Come me. to my aid, yeah. Come, lover. Come to yes. me. Uh, I, I, <laughs> when I read it, I thought it was the latter. I thought it was Silver Fox doing it. But then, when he blinks again and ends up in the Azath house, mm -hmm. um, and he sort of realizes, oh, I can be anywhere I want to be. Maybe it was. Maybe it was the subconscious. I need to be here there now. now but he felt it felt unwitting to him in the moment he's just like whoop, whoop. <laughs> well here i am just blinking around just blinking uh, around i loved the section of him going through the 
the Azoth house, like that whole thing. And I'm so sorry if I'm very distracted. Ropes just appeared. There's going to be like a man at my window in a sec. Oh, cool. I guess they're doing window cleaning. That like SWAT team's coming for you. Something's happening. I'm getting swatted. Jeff, what a prank. Um, <laughs> you thought the Pepsi Coke <laughs> thing was cool. <laughs> I've been working on this for weeks. Uh, so, uh, but like, again, just, it, I felt like it was written so cinematically and I could picture, even though it's sort of abstract in the way that he's navigating where it's like, he's being guided down these these flat tree branches that are steps into darkness and race is like go check out what's over there and he's like what if i don't want it? he's like i'll kill you <laughs> yeah. just kidding but you really you'll go there eventually <laughs> yeah yeah no uh, I, I it was so uh satisfying because the end of gardens of the moon is ralic nam pulling vorkin into the as that oh, house yeah. mm -hmm. and then never seen we never see them again and raced getting trapped in there and we don't know what what the deal is and we had a whole he's novel that race is now the guardian of that house is that so Sick. i'm like oh man the azoth just destroyed him. well he's the guardian of the house but his body is mangled from being crushed by the roots initially at yeah. the end of gardens of the moon so he's like i'm this guardian but his like bones and his feet are all broken his body's all messed up and he's like i'll show you where to go and he's like lurching along like this this busted up body he's like i guess this is my life now well it, he's like, it shows you how how awesome the azath are right Be or the whatever the azath is if it's the house itself or this force that is the house but yeah the idea that this tyrant, this jagged tyrant that is this incredibly potent threat mm -hmm. gets sucked into this house and does it destroy him? No, it makes him the housekeeper. It's like, yeah. we're so awesome. He's like, I will destroy everything. <laughs> no, you will tidy up the place. No, yeah. I'm okay, okay. I will destroy all the dust bunnies. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, come on in, Bran. Ignore that. They've been sleeping for ah, just ignore them. It's He's so like, rad. Uh... It, 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 it's such a cool way to demonstrate the, the power of something because it doesn't obliterate him. It subjugates him. You yeah. know, it, it completely, he turns him into this, it turns him into Mr. Belvedere, you know? <laughs> He's just like, I'll lead you downstairs. And uh, yeah. He's like, well, what if I don't go? You know, and they, like you said, he's like, I'll kill you. Ah, ha, ha, I won't kill you, but you, you're going to go. Why? Because <laughs> there's nothing else to do here. But that's why I've been tidying up. It's just. You think I swept these stairs 15 <laughs> times for you to not walk down them? You're going, baby. Yeah. The Azath are very patient. You are <laughs> you can stand here obstinate for as long as you want. Eventually, you're going down those stairs, bro. <laughs> yeah. Uh... I loved it. And then the second piranha turns. Oh my god! Sorry. <laughs> Is there a person there now? There's a person there now. Do you want to see? Do they want to be in the show. What do you think? <laughs> what did you think of the Azath House, fella? <laughs> it's like right. It's so he's like two feet away from me. Anyway, <laughs> you, we can cut this Amazing. out. It's no, very we're jarring. not cutting this out. <laughs> um, but also. <laughs> Ralik Nam and Vorkin are sleeping, yes. which like mm -hmm. that feels like a bummer because Ralik Nam did this heroic thing and now is just in and, eternal sleep. Uh, he earned a nap, Jeff. Fair enough. Fair enough. He Boy, did what, a heroic what, thing. I'd do it in a heartbeat. Let me tell you, <laughs> if I was offered the chance to just sleep, do you want a for nap years? for an indeterminate amount of time? <sighs> yeah. Greatest gift. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Greatest gift you could give me. Uh, but cool. He's like, I guess we'll be back later. But he sort of, he turns into the darkness and then almost immediately he's like, I don't know what's ahead of me. And he asks Ray, so he goes, I can go in any direction. He's like, yeah, you'll find what you're looking for. And he sort of turns and I picture him sort of spinning into the darkness and almost immediately his boot is no longer on dirt. It's no longer on wood. It touches stone. And he looks at that and he's now in the stone, which is a long forgotten card in the deck of dragons. And he's in this space that he's now intrinsically knowing what it is, where it is, what these pieces are. Yeah. And some of it's foggy, but like he immediately becomes the the owner of the deck. What is it? The master, master of the deck of, of Dragon? The deck. Yeah, master of uh, the deck. I loved how that came into being feeling and how 
I could feel it. I just, I, that whole section in my mind was so cinematic and, and sort of in an avant-garde kind of interesting, but very parsable way. I really love this whole bit. I agree with you. It's, it, it was really cool. And it, 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 I think portends really exciting stuff for the rest of this series, because, you know, he asks Raced why he needs to, why does there need to even, even need to be a master of the deck? It's like, well, all of everything is coming to a head. All of the, everybody's going to be pulled into it. Gods, houses, mortals, everybody. And the Azath is preparing just like everybody else is preparing. Uh, but then interestingly too, he sees the old Talon and Moss, uh, the hold of beasts, which is this incredible image. Again, it's just a throwaway Oof. thing, it seems, in these books of, of the most incredible, like I could see an entire novel set in a culture that lives in the belly of beasts and with these bone and tusk houses. It's just so incredible. And, but he sees uh, before, the, uh, before the ritual, before the first throne, which we know is the thing that Kalanved used to control the Talanamas. Before the first throne, there were two thrones. And he's like, who's going to sit on the two thrones? If only there was a super powerful me and a super powerful <laughs> girlfriend that I have. <laughs> but I feel like in any other series, I'd be like, that's what we're headed towards. But in this series, I feel like it's a swerve. I feel Come like on. it's- And- Mm, the, his, his girlfriend now. <laughs> oh yeah, what's her name? Yeah, me. Yeah, me. because I am. You're right. Uh, Manal. Do you do you do you think because you know Perrin is like I wonder who could sit those two thrones and you immediately I think are led to believe that he and Silver Fox will eventually sit on those thrones. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that's just too obvious it, the way this this series has always subverted my expectations i feel like that is not going to be where we're headed yeah trust no one trust nothing yeah uh yeah. i i do feel like it's either going to be something like um what's the word uh like some pair maybe a pairing we haven't met or it'll be like oh this seems like i'm so sorry is that this so guy loud? is he's just cleaning your window is that's what's happening <laughs> yeah the banging okay apologies for the banging oh, sorry. everybody sorry everyone <laughs> they just clean your he's, window without without informing you it's gonna happen look he's gone now i'll show you there's like ropes right outside the window he was like right there <laughs> Amazing. I was like, what's happening? There's like ropes hitting the window. It like scared the crap out of me. And now there's You'd think like, that morning. like, you, what if you were sleeping in that room and your bed was right near the window? Just a man. I mean, there should that happened to you. me in university. And let me tell you, you girl don't. Same guy. <laughs> you again. <laughs> He's like, I found you. <laughs> and, that, and that one was because my windows were open so I'm like literally running to the blinds like covering myself with blankets to like close the blinds he goes good morning and I'm like what the what is? that was my second day in a, in the states and I was like this place is full of perverts um anyway <laughs> sorry well, it's comforting I guess that the perverts are everywhere it seems <laughs> Um, anyway uh, anyway so the throne I feel like is possibly like you know uh, we see it as possibly where Silver Fox and Piran end up as like, oh, the king and queen of the horde of beasts. Or it's like, oh, those are some sinister ass thrones. And we're going to get future yeah. villains being like, like Lady Envy being like, my turn, baby. I'll sit on both. Right. Uh, very interesting. Also, we find out, uh, I think right around here, that what's the deal with Kaladin Brood, the hammer, and Burn, right? Which I, I, this is all fascinating stuff, right? This because uh, Animanda Rake and, and Brood have this discussion, but before that, we see Perrin learn about the deal here, which is Burn has the fallen chained god leeching off of her, poisoning her, chained to her, just mm -hmm. killing her, and so she decides to use an, all of her life essence to create a weapon to destroy him. And she's like, who can I give this weapon to? Mm -hmm. Somebody I can totally trust to kill the guy. Oh, Caladan Brood, here you go. Could you just knock this dude off me? And he's like, I will not do that. Yeah. She's like, oh, I picked the wrong guy. And, and that I think, time. <laughs> yeah. And so I think the, this interesting question that 
Paladin, and it sounds like Animander and Lady Envy and Osric all conferred to make the decision was you, you kill the fallen god with the mighty hammer and you save burn which you uh, save the the planet save the planet but destroy all magic right oh no 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 i have it backwards well, it, it, if, you, if you kill him burn is is okay Oh, I had this. But I don't think that it'll kill him. It'll just release the chains that are poisoning him. Oh, no, no, him. that's so right. Yeah, it's separate. It, right. That's what it is. You knock him off and it empowers him to destroy the world, which Burn doesn't care about because she starts over. But you mm -hmm. don't you don't knock him off. It kills Burn, which destro could destroy all all warrens Magic, and all sorcery. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Sorry, I had that. I had that in my head and then I lost it. And then I got which, it again. Which the which they're like, yeah, would the world be so bad without sorcery? And it's like, we have no idea what the implications of that would be. With we assume that everybody will perish just the same. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, so they have been holding off and letting burn just slowly die, but that's bad. That's bad. But that's also poisoning through the brood, through the hammer as well. Like he is right. also being affected by it, as far right. as we can tell. I loved having that conversation between Brood and Rake because in the first book, when Crone is kind of going between them, and I was like, oh, I thought they would be like enemies. And it felt like they had a tenuous relationship. And they get in this room together and they're like talking about something beside sort of beside the point. And they're like, dude, bros, we never get to be bros. We bros right now. Let's yeah. talk. Let's, let's let's really break it down. And they're like, nice, nice, nice. And yeah. It felt like a little bro moment. Which I really enjoyed. I agree. It was really cool. Um, so j j this whole chapter, chapter five, is just so juicy with war, mm -hmm. understanding all the stakes, all the parties getting together, the tenuous, you know, um, alliances that we're forging here. I just, it was so fun. Uh, um, Krupp showing up, the wackiness of that, but the but it also kind of upped the stakes of everybody. And, mm -hmm. and you know, we complained, both of us, about how the Trigal Trade Guild, Trade Guild was introduced, the TTG was introduced in uh, Dead House Gates. And I stand by that it kind of comes out of nowhere, but I think if we had never heard of it, it wouldn't land. When Krupp brings, up, brings it up, I'm like, oh, awesome and mm -hmm. if it had just been the first time we'd ever heard of it i would have been like well what who what? it wouldn't have landed in the same way <laughs> and i i kind of appreciated the fact that uh krupp gets to go hey i got this trigal trade guild thing and and we go oh yeah i know what that is mm -hmm. but i still feel like i don't know i feel like there's gotta be a way for him to be like oh it's the uh ttg and then being like and what's the TTG and him being like, just a mm. spectacular Warren riding force right. of nature uh, still could have been interesting. And then when you see what that, how that, what that actually represents, like what that actually looks like in practice, it could be like another exciting moment. Mm. I don't know. I feel like I uh, will, am almost never like, oh, good. Something that showed up and saved the day, but they didn't save the day. I know that's like the point, but. Anyway, I don't. Yeah, to... I'm just saying that I think sometimes those payoffs they come late, but it's like okay, I realize why we had it seeded earlier, even if the seeding felt awkward to me at the time. Anyway, I wonder, you know, how for like Star Wars or things like like long series like this, especially things that have moments that happen out of order or in tandem, they have yeah. like different viewing orders. I wonder if there's like a best reading order <laughs> of the Malazan books. There's like read book one. And then read book two, and then read book three, and then read book two. <laughs> right, 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 right. So it like yeah. feels a little bit because it like it, I think that the all these things are happening in parallel is like a very challenging problem to solve. Yeah. Without. Yeah, I don't know, but it's uh, it's fun. Uh, so chapter six is an interesting chapter because it is just with one of our POV groups. It, we're uh, well, just with Gruntle and Stani and Harlow and Karuli and all those folks. Well, the one thing I want to get to before I get to chapter six that I thought was like a really important detail is about the maybe's relationship as it develops with oh, yes. Thank with you. Uh, Silver Fox. Um, Silver Fox is taking her life force. We know that. 
and when Silver Fox like uses more power or like needs to do something, she's like possibly even subconsciously draining more energy in an effort to become a woman faster so that she seems like less of a threat and more like somebody with a fully formed brain and emotions that wouldn't just like fly off the handle and blast half of the world away. Um, And the piece that the maybe keeps telling herself is like, I do not want to give in to hate, but I can feel hate building for my daughter as she takes more and more of my life force. And this tender moment between um, her and Crone yeah. and the Tistiandi, uh, what's her name? Also starts with a K. Yeah. Uh, I'll find it. Yes. Uh, um, her and the Crone, which I thought was just so beautiful because, you know, she has become this old woman. Crone is, I think, another word for like an, an old woman. And it, and it seems like there's this like connection between them. She's like, mm. sees her. She's like, don't tell anybody I'm being nice to you, but I can't Corlat. like this Corlat. Uh, like I see what you're, you're feeling. And I just want you to know that I, I see you and then being able to, to sort of bring her aside and give her this safe space. And then Corlat saying, you know, relax your heart, relax your mind. You're like, you are of the Tisty Andy now. And that sort of adoption of her into this new culture, I just thought was a really significant moment and really beautiful, raw emotions of this mother of having her life drained away. I'm so glad you made a point to bring up that scene because it also affected me uh, very profoundly. It's beautiful. And it's the, the actual love that Crone, you know, speaks to her. It really seems genuine like crone really does love the sacrifice that this woman has given and i think that is a very relatable feeling as a parent you do have these moments where it's like i don't want to hate my kid they are Mm. destroying my life in a you know or in this moment they are i just want peace and quiet i just want to be away from my kids i don't want to hate them stop doing the thing you're doing Stop needing me. Stop draining my life force. I think it's a very relatable sentiment. And Mm -hmm. it it, it was really beautifully illustrated. And and you're right. It's this amazing thing. And then, you know, maybe saying, uh, the maybe saying, I just want to end it. I just want to die. I just want to kill myself. And Corlat and Crone saying, we will not let you do that. Mm -hmm. Corlat saying, I will sit with you. I will be with you. I'm not going to let you do that. It was just amazing. It was so, so beautiful. And thinking about crones, you know, like we learned about the birth of the ravens in a way. I mean, they got birthed out of the body of the crippled god. And I don't know if, like for me, there's like interesting implications. Is crone sympathetic to this because in a sense she was birthed in a way that Silver Fox was? Are these ravens in the same way that, with um god i can't believe how bad at names i am the same way with uh the guy from the first book coltane you know they needed all of the the ravens to take the, this that that one sorcerer soul away in like 11 days right. the existence of these ravens are those all pieces of the cripple god in the same way silver fox is a is taking the life force mm, interesting from the maybe like is the is the crippled god so crippled because he also birthed all of the ravens and gave them existence and so is there a sympathy there or that could be like going too far down the rabbit hole but no i love that i love that that's really interesting yeah yeah it was just it it was a beautiful scene and you i just feel so for the maybe she's she's done this selfless act and at the end her she's she's so so in pain and so so hobbled by it that she's at the end of her ability to be selfless and she just wants relief and, and doesn't want to hate the kid for doing it to her. Mm -hmm. Um, It's, it's amazing. And that's that thing about like, well, she can only take from me because everybody else in her has no life force. They're all dead, you know, and the Tilana Moss are all undead. So they have no life force to even pull from. So all she's got is me. And that beautiful moment where Crone says, she is more you than any of the other souls within her. Like you, and which is like, I mean, it made me emotional when I was reading it because as a parent, you have those intuitions too, where it's like, 
there's all these influences on your kid. There's all these parts of them. There's, there's nature versus nurture, but like they're, they're you, you know, they are an expression of you also. And it's just, it was such a beautiful, and I'm so glad you made a point to talk about that scene. Cause you're right. It's one of my favorite scenes in this entire novel so far. Yeah. All right. But we get to chapter six and we're just hanging out with Gruntel, Stani and Harlow. Uh, and this section is, was just so much fun to read. We get big <laughs> action. We get goofy, sexy time with the, uh, with the folks as well, <laughs> which was so much fun. Like all of it is so fun. Mm -hmm. Um, we get cool revelations about who, uh, Corbelo Dom or no, 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 excuse me. Um, uh, the, uh, the two, what are they called? What are their names? Uh, Corbel Brooch and. Yes. How did you one? get that confused? <laughs> I, no. A lot of K names. The other one starts names. with a, a B and it's like Frenchy sounding. Yeah. Uh, Beauchelin. Beauchelin. Uh, Beauchelin. Beauchelin. Yeah. Beauchelin. <laughs> um, so we start with uh, them going to this uh, outlaw town, uh, Saltone, uh, and the, just the whole process of getting in there with the carriage, having to fit down the tight thing that is intentionally tight so they can trap people there and steal from them. And Gruntel's like, yeah, I killed like half this town last time. Um, yeah. <laughs> that was all and, rad stuff. And again, it's like another like instant like such a brief glimpse into this interesting world that the yeah. this, the town's like, oh, your car gets stuck here? It's instantly fair salvage. Yeah. And that people are waiting for that. It's like yeah. a cool, literally like a cool corridor that feels like, you know, a yeah. beautiful corner of a video game. It yeah, outlaw great. town. It's just, the, yeah. the, it, it immediately, and then uh, Karuli is there to meet with all the heads of all the outlaws to be like, hey, the Penny and Doman are real bad. How bad are they? Well, <laughs> when people are dying, ladies go out and make babies with them. It's called the children yeah. of the dead seed. I was like, oh my Lord, that is some dark, it's dark gruesome. stuff. That's yeah. gruesome. I, well, I will say that was like, I, I was like the mechanics of that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to think about it too long either. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not, eh, the children are made. I mean, <laughs> in one sense, if you're dying on the battlefield, <laughs> if you gotta go, I should say, if you gotta go, <laughs> there are worse ways. I'm just saying. It's a, in, in some sense, like having a lady run over to you and you're like, I'm dying. She's like, I know, I know, I know, I know. just hush, hush, hush. This will all be over soon. Oh, sweet. Thanks for the <laughs> final goodbye. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh. um, but <laughs> super dark. And this notion of the tennis scoury, which is, you know, they literally like get all the poor people and they're like, hey, join the cult. And they're like, oh, thanks. Do we get food and stuff? No, 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 no. You eat people and you do horrible <laughs> things. And like, I guess it's better than dying. So yeah. uh, it's just so, no doubt the Penny and Domen are real bad, real mm -hmm. bad. And uh, Cruelly says, uh, you know, even, they don't even care that you murder their priests. Like they're not even worried about that. That's not going to stop them. The only way to stop them is with words and, you know, uh, changing minds, which I thought was interesting. Uh, and then we're, you know, we got to get to, uh, the city, so we got to move through this area that is the Panindomen is overtaken. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to try to sneak. Uh, and well, we're going to try and sneak. Like if we're going to get there and the Panindomen's there, he's like, "Well, then you can do whatever." But I have sneaky skills, and they're yeah, like, right. "Can we know more about that?" And he's like, "Nope." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like I. Go down on a wire right in front of people's windows. <laughs> yeah. um, sneaky skills. Um, <laughs> but then we we find out that there are some white face bar gassed, uh, in the area. And Cruelly's like, let's hang out with them. They could be awesome. They'll be, be able, let's team up. Um, and so we meet these three, uh, these three children, these three. Well, can I interrupt for one sec? With Cruelly's like whole thing, there's like an omnipotence 
like a semi omnipotence, right? He's like always, always hearing, always knowing. Yeah. Is this like like a Warren thing? That's like must be like magical sorcery. Yes. Like no matter where so. they are, he comes back. He's like, yeah, I heard you. Obviously. Yeah. It's like there's like. Yes. I think that's it's just accurate. an interesting character trait that he's like, I'm in here, but I'm hearing. He's just listening. He's yeah. like the guy. <laughs> what is it in the Matrix with all the TVs? Just like. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah, I know already. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I I love he's fascinating and he's got this cloak mm-hmm. that looks like shimmering water. You yeah, know? he's cool. Um, so so uh, they find so they they, they hang out with the bar guest. There's mm-hmm. some sexy time fun. The <laughs> which is a hilarious and delightful scenes of all that stuff. Um, the they they come up upon a uh, Corbal brooch and Beauchelain's Beauchelain's carriage, which looks like it has been attacked by bandits. Except mm-hmm. that all the doors have been sliced like big blades, and the Bargast give them some sick info, which is we're hunting demons, mm-hmm. and we trap spirits with these upsy downsy tree trunks. And the spirits sometimes will give us little visions about what to what to look out for. A lot of them have been saying giant dinosaur demons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Bladed demons. handed <laughs> velociraptors. I keep picturing, you know how people make those pictures of like birds with arms? <laughs> yes. I keep picturing those, but it's like two swords. I picture the silliest thing. They're obviously spooky and very intense, but I picture like a like a cobra with velociraptor legs and just like two rapiers. Yeah, <laughs> I, that's like, what I picture. I picture velociraptor from Jurassic Park with sword arms. Yeah, <laughs> it's so silly. <laughs> I'm like, are they bend? Are they straight blades? <laughs> I can't like. I have to draw this. Getting you. Yeah. <laughs> but I anyway, mean, we find out how terrifying they are very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. But I also love this notion of how the bargast use the spirits and trap the spirits, and they got these. Uh, what's the What's the cool word? Um, uh, stick, stick snare. Stick snare. What a cool word. Stick what snare. I liked about this is the way that they describe the barcast is is like the visualization of them and like their whole attitude feels um like less contemporary in such a way that you'd be like, oh, these are like silly um magics of like the village elder, like in any other book this would be like the type of people they'd be like, the spirits told us and they'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The spirits told you. But in this case, they're like, oh yeah, the spirits told us we did these stick snares. Like we know just as much, if not more about what we're heading into than you do. Like everything that they are offering is not like some archaic thing. It's just a, their way of interacting with the world, their way of understanding it. And yeah, uh, it's cool to see it immediately proven out. They're like, we we pictured big lizards with with sword arms, and then like, well, there they are. <laughs> That's what there it is. they are. <laughs> Before they show up, though, we get some really disturbing information about Corbal Brooch and Beauchelaine because they find uh, w- one of the most disturbing expressions of necromancy I've ever read. Like, necromancy is never fun, you know. It's mm-hmm. never, it always it's always a little creepy whenever you hear about necromancy. But the idea of a knee high height person assembled out of organs that don't quite work, just kept in a box. Unbelievable. What an image. What Gruesome. an image. Uh, I also, love, by the way, I also love about the, the white face borgast, how they put Vaseline all over their bodies to keep the flies off and just yeah. greased up all the time. <laughs> so funny. Um, uh, they're protected from uh, buggies, but also ready for the bodybuilding competition. Oh yeah, always. Uh, or ready uh, to go. you know, writing people. <laughs> um, so th- yeah, the fact that they are necromancers, and then you know, building up to this thing, uh, Buke is back. My boy, my boy Buke. I love Buke, mm-hmm. but he's not looking too hot because he's like, hey. I realized that Corbal Brooch is the serial killer. Uh, and I know why, because he mm-hmm. needs those body parts, sweet, sweet body parts. And 
worse than that, we ran into one of these demons or a couple of these demons, three of them. And it was all we could do to survive. We are not going to live through the night. Uh, it's bad. Yeah. They unleashed their entire menagerie of demons and other magic spirits they had trapped, contained, whatever other necromantic disgustingness yeah. was released from their carriage. And like, we already used everything. Yeah. And we, we barely survived. Left. And there's yeah. more of them coming. Yeah. Just an awesome setup. And I, I felt so much tension and it was such a page turner because I'm like, oh man, it's, it's, it's coming to a head. It's coming to a head. And of course it does mm -hmm. because we have this incredible battle that takes place in sort of sorcery induced fog where you can't quite see everything and people you hear screams and there's reptiles attacking and getting sliced and being shredded by sorcery and it's just an incredible sequence and gruntle gets kicked and thrown and tossed into a wagon and thinks he might be dead uh the image of one of the things attacking him and the, the sheer force of it slicing at him and him successfully blocking it, but immediately shattering all the bones in his wrist just to do so. Yeah. And then like every, like the idea of the thing grabbing him with his talons and crushing around him. And he's like, his, all his ribs are popping yeah. as that's happening. Very visceral fight ends with Gruntle heading in, heading into the darkness of, yeah. of, of death. Uh, the, the description of that too is amazing where he's like, this isn't how it's supposed to be. I'm not supposed to like, notice this yeah, was, yeah I, oh, so so powerful um mm. an incredible sequence um you know uh, the the necromancers are amazing the way that fight happens with not knowing what's even going on because it's all just shrouded in in you know this this fog of war literally fog of war I was so taken by that scene and, um, you know, I hope Gruntle is okay. I get the sense that he's not dead, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, who is, I'm sure. I think, I think Har Harlow, I think Harlow is, you get that. He blocks the, the, uh, the, the attack, the sideways. I love how they're like, it's always sideways slices. So get gay, get low and he blocks it, mm -hmm. but it shatters his, both of his swords and it slices him all up. Ugh. Incredible. Yeah, the, the the shrapnel that comes from the force of those things just immediately shreds his whole face. Dude, incredible. Um, so there you go. That's the end of this book of this novel. Uh, mm -hmm. We will start the next uh, book. I think the, isn't it called Hearthstone? It is called Hearthstone. Which hey, <laughs> hey, huh? hey, right? Look at that. <laughs> uh, I wish you know we could have had. Uh, when the whirlwind was happening in book two, it could have had one called Heroes of the Storm. Oh. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I loved I loved these two chapters. A anything you're hoping for moving forward or anything, any other wrap ups you want to say about chapter six or chapter the five? The only thing I want to, the thing I'm looking forward to going forward is the, uh, something I forgot to mention, the relationship between Calor and Quick Ben. Calor is like, you'll get yours, Quick Ben. And he's like, you were going to fight and I'm going to kill you. And Quick Ben's like, oh my Maybe. gosh. And then makes a hole underneath <laughs> that him. Was so and he's just like, awesome. <laughs> it was so Looney Tunes. It, it was, was so, so awesome. ridiculous. He's like, I am going <laughs> to. Quick Ben's like, yeah, we should probably leave before he climbs out. And everybody's and like, yeah, you know what? I... We all should leave. <laughs> he's doing pretty good for an old guy. Like this ancient being so you just great. put into a pit and then everybody's like scram <laughs> so looking forward to more of the petty magics between quick Ben and keller <laughs> i 100 percent agree that was delightful it's just a funny thing of like i, I, I just like <laughs> or i could just drop you into a a, a big hole that i create <laughs> And slowly slink away while you climb out. He's like, oh, I hate that guy. <laughs> so good. The other funny, the other th wonderful detail that I forgot to mention when we were talking about the Segula is how they had a whole fight and the one guy couldn't get his sword out, but he parried all the blocks just like oh, yeah. with the sword still in the scabbard. Just like, I just thought that was incredible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so rad. So rad. <laughs> all right. 
Well, we got sentences for you. Uh, we always pick our favorite sentences from the sections we've read to share with you. Uh, Lana, are you ready to share a sentence? Yes. I Well, uh, rather than my usual, oh, I actually have like three. I have like a longer section that was my favorite section that, of course, features Krupp, sweet Krupp, my angel, <laughs> um, uh, talking in the tent that he's like, I'm definitely invited to be here. And, <laughs> okay, yeah. I love it. So it <laughs> just shows everything that's great about him. Krupp's brows rose and he nearly choked on a mouthful of sweet cake, spraying crumbs as he coughed. He quickly drank down his ale, then belched. By the abyss, what a distasteful notion. And entirely in error, Krupp assures everyone. Baruch has a keen interest in the smooth conduct of this prestigious gathering of legendary persons. The success of the venture impending is uppermost in his mind, and he pledges to do all that is within his and his servant Krupp's formidable abilities. Has your master specific suggestions? Brood asked. Innumerable suggestions of a specific nature, Sir Warlord. So many that when combined, they can only be seen or understood in the most general terms. <laughs> I love that so much. <laughs> they're so specific that they're general. I just love yeah. it. It's so amazing. What an asshole. <laughs> I know. It's so great, though. It's just... Uh, yeah. Just do, being do in that thing, uninvited, oh. eating food, gagging, burping... Like, just, like, sculling his ale and then being like, I'm definitely here intentionally because you want me here. And the suggestions, they're so specific. They're going to blow your mind. Because, but yeah. I can only – they're <laughs> so he, specific. They're general. Does he, you does he have it. any suggestions? So many suggestions. <laughs> oh, my God. All the suggestions. But there's really just one. The one. <laughs> so great. Erickson uh, writes a, a wonderful bullshit artist. You know, he writes yes. a wonderful bullshit artist. It's uh, yeah. it's delightful. Uh, that was a great. I, I, I remember laughing aloud at that. Um, here's one of a completely different tone. <laughs> this was one that resonated with me because I feel this way often. This is called getting old. This is the, the maybe uh, expressing how she feels. Her bones were a rack of dull, incessant pains an ebb and flow of twinges that only the deepest of sleep could temporary evade and temporarily evade the kind of sleep that had begun to elude her. <laughs> it's like, and her, everything hurts. Oh, I just need to sleep. I can't sleep. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I have one more too. Mm -hmm. And this was, this was when Anamanda Rake shows up. And mm -hmm. I don't know if I've ever read a more epic description of a character ever. This is the description of Anamanda Rake arriving when everybody is standing there, the circle of, of other Tistiandi waiting for them. And this is, this is how Rake is described. Rake was an atmosphere, a heart-thudding, terror-threaded presence no one could ignore much less escape. Violence, antiquity, somber pathos, and darkest horror. The son of darkness was a gelid eddy in, in immortality's current, and the maybe could feel, crawling beneath her very skin, every rivy spirit awakened in desperation. Uh, I mean, come <laughs> on. <laughs> I'm like, it's so powerful. And like, even just from the Ugh. first sentence, like just from that first bit, describing someone as an atmosphere. Rake was like, an atmosphere. Whoo. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <sighs> Incredible. Love it. Love yeah. it. It doesn't get much better than that. Uh, all right. So we also like to end the show with some recommendations of other stuff that we have read that you may enjoy. Uh, mm -hmm. Lana, do you have a suggestion for another book? I do. And despite looking up the pronunciation of the author's name before this, I'm probably still going to get it wrong. Uh, my book recommendation this week is The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho. It is a brief read. And I know we talked about rereads recently. Uh, also on the list of one of the few books that I've reread that is uh, 
about uh, an interesting adventure and seeking and finding happiness. I really, I read this, uh, I think when I was still in high school and I don't know, it just really affected me. And, and it's an interesting perspective on the world. I think there's a, for such a short book, it's got a lot of beautiful, poetic, juicy moments in there. So highly recommend. Very cool. Uh, we've been talking about audiobooks, and so I wanted to make a recommendation of something I listened to as an audiobook. Um, when I had eye surgery a few years ago, uh, I couldn't watch anything. I couldn't uh, read anything traditionally. So I basically just sat in the dark with an eye patch and listened to audiobooks. One of them that I listened to was a book called Senlin Ascends by Josiah Bancroft. Uh, this is undeniably a fantasy novel. It is a fantasy uh, work, but it is very much unconventional in its, in its fantasy. It is not, uh, I mean, it is a grand adventure, but it, it, it takes, it uses a very um, uh, unlikely protagonist, a, a sort of inept school teacher who's going on vacation with his wife mm -hmm. and they are headed to this giant tower called the Tower of Babel. Every floor is like a different kingdom unto itself, completely different, but it just ascends. Nobody knows how long it's been there. It's this wild place, but it's also kind of a vacation destination. Um, <laughs> so they decide to go there uh, for holiday, but before they even get there, his wife disappears. And so he enters into the tower searching for her. And uh, it's all about the wild things that take place inside the tower and his search for her. And it is so beautifully written. I love the prose in this book. And the narrator, whose name I should have looked up, um, is fantastic. Just mm. fantastic. I highly recommend this in audio form. Uh, it, is, um, it is a delight. I haven't read the sequels. Uh, I think there are two more in this trilogy. Um, but let's see who the audiobook reader is. Uh, it is read by John Banks. Uh, mm. John Banks, uh, and uh, it's a brisk 14 hours. I, I highly recommend it. I thought it was a really interesting book, and I love the prose. I just thought it was such beautifully written and beautifully read. So a That's, really cool book. Uh, when Jeff and I were debating between the uh, Swords and Deviltry, which is what we're listening to now, um, and that was the other book we were debating between listening to our like nightly audiobook. So great to hear your recommendation on that. Oh, I think you'll dig it. I'm very curious to hear what you think of it because you may be very frustrated by the main character because he's kind of a <laughs> kind of a doofus, you know. But uh, <laughs> but in a very lovable way, I, I found you know very relatable yeah. way. He's a very unlikely hero because he's just like, <laughs> and where's my wife? I just want to find her. <laughs> you know, he's not he's not you know he's not a grand adventurer by any sense. Yeah. he gets pulled into it. Um, so there you go. There's some book book recommendations for you next week, unless we are advised otherwise. <laughs> looking at you, Saurav. Uh, we will do three chapters, uh, chapters seven, eight, and nine. Uh, the new book, Hearthstone, uh, in uh, in Memories of Ice. So stick with us. Keep reading along. We appreciate it. We love your comments and questions. Hang out in that Discord. Uh, let us know any other audiobook uh, feedback you'd like or or whatever strikes your fancy. Uh, the Discord is a 5 by 5 DLC on Discord. We have a book club section there. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Until then, we got to dance it out. When the world's too dark of a place to be And you need an escape from reality Open up those pages and start crying Doing it with your friends, so join the book club.